So our next speaker is Rick Pannen with his talk, Vapor Face Soldering with a Deep Fryer. So Rick has been uh, doing hardware design, design for some time now. He actually considers himself a full stack developer from the hardware world. So basically going from software to hardware, uh, it's everything from doing circuits to firmware development on embedded Linux. He usually does his stuff in a small series production in order to uh, be able to give out some of the samples uh, to the community where he has also been spending a bunch of time. Um, he's trying to slowly move to a process of being able to do as much as possible in-house. Um, and this talk is a result of that process. Please give a great, great round of applause, at least at home, to uh, Rick Pannen. Thank you. Hi. Welcome to my talk, Vapor Face Soldering with a Deep Fryer. In this talk, I'll first explain the reflow process in detail, and then I'll show you the, how Vapor Face Soldering works and how to do it with a cheap deep fryer. Reflow soldering basically consists of three steps. First, you apply some solder paste to a circuit board. Then you place your components onto the solder paste. And finally, you apply some heat to do the actual soldering. For that, uh, you need some solder paste. Um, solder paste comes in a hundred uh, thousand varieties. Um, most of them have has different melting points and different ingredients, but uh, the common lead-free paste that uh, you use these days are uh, melt about 210 to 225 degrees, and uh, the majority of the solar paste has a limited shelf life and has to be kept kept in a fridge uh, if you're not using it. So for home use, I would recommend using uh, the solder paste that comes in syringes because it's a lesser amount and it probably won't go bad unless you use a lot of solder paste. Also, it's a bit easier to apply. All solder paste uh, comes with a temperature profile that tells you exactly um, how many seconds you should ramp up uh, the temperature to a certain amount and then uh, you have a soaking phase where um, for uh, several seconds you keep the temperature um, at the same point and then for a very short amount of time you ramp up the temperature to the reflow phase uh, that's when the actual soldering happens and then you have to uh, remove the temperature to cool it down. Um, for applying the solder paste, there are two basic methods. The first one is a direct paste application. Um, so you can do that manually by just uh, taking your syringe and applying a small amount of solder paste to each pad uh, where you want to put your SMD components. Um, then uh, the next step would be a modified CNC mill or 3D printer. Uh, where you put in um, a solder paste syringe as a tool head and uh, then load in your paste layer from your electronics design software and uh, the uh, printer then or the CNC mill automatically applies the solder paste to the pads on the board. And uh, for industrial uh, applications, there are also inkjet printer-like devices that um, apply the solder paste automatically to PCBs. But yeah, these devices are, are very expensive and probably not suitable for home use. Um, for home users, I would recommend uh, getting a stencil uh, for solder paste applications because stencil have become very cheap in the recent years and uh, it's, it's much simpler to apply the solder paste with the stencil than doing it manually. So um, stencils uh, can be used also in different ways. Uh, the simplest and cheapest one is just um, putting your boards on a desk and uh, using some tape to um, apply your stencil to it. So you position it over your board and then you fix it to your desk 
and after that uh, you use a rake to um, wipe your solder paste uh, to the board. I will show that later in the demo. Um, for home users, I would definitely recommend uh, getting frameless stencils. Um, when you order a stencil in your, at your PCB house, you can uh, always have you always have a checkbox where you can say I want a frame or no frame. Um, the first time I ordered a stencil, I took the framed version, and uh, that looks like this. So you get a gigantic thing, um, and there in the middle is actually my, um, I can't really see it, uh, maybe like this. There are, uh, this is the actual board, and um, yeah, this is the stencil. It has some, some aluminium framing around it, and uh, that's definitely very expensive for shipping. So you'd rather want something like this, so a frameless stencil that can be uh, used very easily for the method where you um just put it on your desk uh if you do a lot of the same boards then um there are stencil printers or manual stencil printers that's uh where you use the stencils with a frame but um these stencil printers are not cheap and uh i think the the tape on desk method uh is pretty simple to use so Unless you, you make a, a batch production of boards, uh, I would always uh, just get a frame, a stencil, and do it on your desk. Um, for industrial environments, there are automatic stencil printers that uh, have a conveyor belt, uh, pull in the PCB, do all the positioning, and then automatically uh, apply the solder paste to the stencil. Um, after uh, you've put the solder paste on your board, uh, then you need to place your components. Again, the, the cheapest way and what, what uh, most home users will do is just um, take all the components manually with some tweezers and uh, to put it on your board. Because of the way that reflow soldering works, and uh, you will see, it, see that later in the demo, you don't have to position them uh, too exactly because uh, the surface tension of um, the solder paste when it starts to melt will um, pull the, uh, the components into position. So um, you don't have to be too precise with positioning. You, you shouldn't place it right next to the footprint, but um, if, it, if it's not exactly uh, where it should be, then this should be resolved uh, while in the reflow soldering process later. Um, so uh, I would always recommend uh, getting some good tweezers uh, if you uh, do the manual placement and not using the two euro things from the DIY store because um, yeah, the, they will bend easily and uh, so some good tweezers really help um, with this process. Um, the next step would be a pick and place machine. Uh, that uh, takes a file from your design program um, that uh, has all the positions of the components and the rotation that it needs uh, after picking up the components from a reel or from a tray and uh, then uses little suction cups to, to uh, place the components on the board. Um, these have become a little bit cheaper in the recent years, uh, but it's quite a hassle to, to program it for a lot of components. So unless you're doing more than 20 boards or so, it's not really worth uh, getting a pick and place machine and programming it and getting all the, the rotation and, and uh, the pickup correctly. Um, so yeah, for for uh, projects where you do one to five boards, I always uh, do the manual placement. And then uh, in industrial environments, there are also uh, these uh, pick and place machine like in the middle, but uh, for very high volume production, there are also machines uh, called uh, ship shooters that uh, have a revolving turret uh, that picks up components and then uh, shoot them uh, to the PCB. Once your components are placed on the board, you will need uh, to solder it. And um, 
the cheapest method here is to use a hot air gun. If you ever did this, um, you will know that it's uh, not uh, as easy as it looks. So you set your hot air gun to a temperature and you set the airflow. And often if you set the airflow too high, then uh, you blow your components off the board. Or uh, if you set the temperature you too high, you burn some components or you desolder stuff that you don't want to desolder on other parts of the board. So it's mostly used if you do replacement of single components. So you want to rework a chip or, or replace one. Um, or if you do really just a few components, then this can uh, also be uh, the method to use. But uh, I'd always recommend if you do that, then uh, use some solder paste that has a lower melting point. So uh, I listed one from ChipQuick here that uh, I am using for uh, hot air reflowing, and that melts at just uh, 135 degrees C. So uh, that makes it way easier to get the setting right on your hot air gun. Um, the next thing is uh, uh, using a modified pizza oven. So you get uh, yeah, a cheap pizza oven and uh, you put some thermocouples uh, into it to have a, a good temperature measurement. And then uh, most hobby users uh, add some um, controller, uh, for example, an Arduino based controller that then tries to uh, keep the temperature profile that uh, you've seen on the solder paste. Um, that works well for some stuff, but uh, because these oven have these uh, heating coils in on the top, um, you have to be really careful with the placement of your PCB underneath it, because there are some spots that are hotter and some are colder. And in general, it's, it's hard to get uh, good results with a pizza oven. Um, often you have to add uh, some, some airflow to get a, a better distribution of the temperature. Sometimes uh, it's hard to ramp up the temperature fast enough. And yeah, it's kind of a hassle. So um, I also use this method and that's uh, why I switched to vapor phase soldering because that's a process that's much easier to control at home. And um, yeah, in industrial environments, uh, you have uh, large reflow ovens that have different zones with different temperature, and then you have a conveyor belt, and your the PCB uh, goes uh, on this conveyor belt through the oven and through the different zones. And then by just adjusting the speed of the conveyor, uh, it's very easy to uh, control the heat that is applied to the board. Instead of using an oven for reflow soldering, you can also use a vapor phase soldering. And um, that's a, a very simple concept that has been around since the 1970s uh, that works by using a phase chamber with a heater on the bottom. Um, phase chamber is just a sophisticated word for a cooking pot. So yeah, just like a cooking pot, uh, you have some kind of container and uh, underneath it you have a heat source and then inside of the container you have a liquid called galden. Uh, galden is a liquid plastic that uh, has some very unique properties. So um, the most important one is uh, that it has a boiling temperature of about uh, 200 degrees. So there's galden um, for different temperatures um, the, just like solder paste, so there's one that uh, evaporates at 170 degrees uh, uh, and uh, some that evaporates in up to 260 degrees. And um, now when you apply heat to this garden, at some point it begins to boil and then it forms uh, a vapor that is heavier than air so it stays at the bottom of this chamber. And uh, that way you uh, have a, um, a low temperature on the top of the chamber and uh, a higher temperature um, on the bottom of the chamber. And the temperature will be exactly the boiling temperature of the garden. So um, it's li just like with uh, water, 
if you cook water, then you get uh, water vapor. And uh, unless you put it under uh, pressure, the water vapor will have exactly 100 degrees and not more. And uh, that's uh, just like with the galden vapor, um, that uh, if you have galden that is, uh, has a boiling point of 230 degrees, then uh, the vapor will have exactly 230 degrees. And uh, unless all the galden in the phase chamber has evaporated, uh, nothing will, uh, will change. So you can never get a too high temperature. And um, in uh, most of the, uh, these uh, chambers for vapor phase soldering, you also have a cooling system um, on the top. So uh, because uh, galden is pretty expensive, you don't want to lose any of it. Now, if you put a PCB in this chamber and slowly lower it into the vapor, then uh, the temperature on the PCB uh, will uh, slowly rise to uh, the uh, galden's boiling temperature. And um, as uh, this galden vapor condensates on the parts of the PCB, and it does it uh, everywhere where, it, uh, where the vapor touches the PCB, then it will very evenly heat up all the components and also the solder paste on the PCB to exactly the galden's boiling temperature. And uh, that way you have a process that's, that's very easy to control because it's not really possible to overheat your components uh, or the solder paste. So by timing the lowering and the lifting of the PCB into the vapor, you can uh, very nicely follow the temperature profile of your soldering paste. One drawback of this process is uh, that the gallon is very expensive. So if you have a large industrial uh, vapor phase um, reflow oven, um, you need some liters of it. And uh, as you see here, uh, five liters costs um, about a thousand dollars. But uh, for the process I'm showing now with uh, the small deep fryer, you just need a very small amount. So um, I use about 250 milliliters. And uh, at least in Europe, uh, you can get uh, 400 milliliters of the 230 degree gallon at uh, beta layout for 88 euros. So um, for the deep fryer vapor phase soldering, you need to buy a deep fryer for about 100 euros and uh, galden for 90 euros. So uh, the whole process can be done for under 200 euros. And if you're worried about the safety, uh, galden is actually uh, very safe because it's, it's basically inert. So it's no problem if you breathe in the vapor or if you even swallow it. Um, the uh, safety instructions that come with the galden say, if you breathe it in, then you should go outside and take uh, two or three deep breaths. And if you swallow it, you should drink two glasses of water. In an industrial environment, you have these large um, vapor phase machines that uh, also use a conveyor belt and automate the whole process. And uh, yeah, these are very expensive, but uh, for lab use and prototyping, there are these uh, smaller machines that also cost a couple of thousand euros, but uh, they are basically um, a container with a heater on the bottom, a temperature probe, and some kind of controller. And these are exactly the same as deep fryers. So deep fryers also have some kind of heating coil at the bottom and uh, they have a controller and uh, somewhere there's a temperature probe to keep the temperature that you set on the controller. And uh, I've looked at uh, lots of these devices and uh, finally I found one uh, that uh, fits very good to my use case and uh, the size of the boards that I'm usually making. And uh, that, that is a WMF mini fryer. Um, it is quite small and it has a lid that is uh, sealed. So uh, there's not much vapor escaping. And um, a very nice thing it, uh, is that when the lid is closed, uh, by turning the handle, you can lower and lift the basket inside. 
Um, it uh, has a container that can be taken out um, that is quite flat on the bottom and that is also important because if you have the heating coils inside of the container you need a lot of the expensive galden to um, put uh, that much in it that it um, that it fills it up above the heating rods, and uh, because the heating rod here is in the bottom, um, that's uh, the, you just need uh, about two hundred fifty milliliters, uh, so the whole bottom is covered with gallon. Um, the temperature sensor in this device is uh, just. Um, at the point where the if you put in um, uh, cooking oil, then uh, it's just where the lower level indicator is uh, on the container, and um, the uh, the temperature sensor is basically outside and it measures the temperature of the container at a certain height. Um, when uh, we're using this for vapor phase soldering, um, this temperature sensor will be above the liquid. Which is pretty nice because it will uh, basically measure the temperature of the vapor and not of the liquid. Um, the only drawback is uh, that it can just be set to 190 degrees and not more, um, which is, I think, kind of a, um, due to the fact that you shouldn't try uh, something like potatoes with a higher temperature because there can be some uh, cancerous stuff developing if you fry it with too much heat. Um, but yeah, that's no problem for uh, vapor phase soldering. So uh, we have to somehow modify it that uh, we can turn the temperature higher. Um, fortunately, this device doesn't have any electronics. Uh, it's all um, pretty discreet. Uh, so it has uh, the temperature probe and uh, that has a certain resistance and then you have the knob in front where you set the temperature and uh, you that's also just a potentiometer where you set a resistance and then it just compares the resistance of uh, the, the temperature probe to the resistance that you uh, set on this potentiometer and if it's higher it switches off the heater. So um, the, uh, you just have to turn the knob a little bit further than you can to, uh, to have a higher temperature range uh, on that device. And you can do that by opening up the bottom and then uh, there's a little metal piece that stops the potentiometer from turning too far. You can uh, take a screwdriver and bend that up a bit and I guess uh, uh, it works the same for all the cheap deep fryers on the market. So uh, they should be all basically the same and just have a mechanical limiter uh, that uh, can be removed. So yeah, uh, you, you bend up this little metal piece and then you uh, screw uh, the bottom part back on. And then there's a second limiter that you see when you take off the knob on the front. Um, there's a little plastic part that uh, also stops the knob from uh, turning too far. Um, so just uh, take a sharp knife and uh, cut away that plastic part and then you can uh, turn the knob as far as you want. To prevent too much of the precious gallon to escape through the lid, um, we also need to add some cooling. Uh, I just used uh, an old uh, PC cooler that I found somewhere in my basement. Um, I also wanted to add a water cooler at some point and uh, looked at some uh, water coolers for graphics cards, but uh, the ones I found were too expensive or not really available or not really fitting, uh, but I'm still looking to uh, add that and uh, then probably I would uh, lose uh, even less garden uh, through the lid. So um, now let me show you how that all works. Here uh, I prepared uh, the board. Um, I'm gluing it uh, with some double-sided tape onto my desk and uh, add some, some old boards around it. Uh, the upper one I also glued to the board. Um, then I put uh, 
the stencil on it, uh, taped it uh, onto the upper board, and uh, used again an old board to rake the solder paste over it. And as you can see, um, that works pretty nicely. So it's not that hard to use that solder paste. Now I'm putting some components to the board, um, and uh, I have attached a temperature probe to uh, the basket. You don't really need that, it's just uh, for this demo to, uh, sh to show how it works. Uh, this temperature probe is not working really well, so it's not uh, 13 degrees uh, where <laughs> I'm doing this. Um, it's plus minus 10 degrees. I think it was damaged at some point. So you make sure that there's enough galvan, uh, that the whole bottom of the container is covered with it. Then you put your basket with your board on it and uh, switch on the deep fryer. So um, I uh, put it to about where 210 degrees would be, uh, if it would be on the scale. And then it takes um, about three to four minutes uh, until some vapor is forming uh, on the top of the PCB. Um, here I waited a bit too long because I had to to, figure, uh, to handle the camera. So um, you see it's already starting to solder. So um, I should have lowered it uh, much sooner. But now I'm lowering it, and as we can see, the temperature is rising quickly to um, yeah where it should be. And here you see uh, through the glass um, how the soldering works and how the components are put into place by the surface tension of the solder paste. And um, yeah, you can just uh, uh, watch it uh, through this window and uh, see when everything is nice and shiny and, and everything is soldered. And then you switch, you, you switch off uh, the deep fryer, um, raise the basket again and uh, wait for a few minutes for it to cool down. I uh, didn't wait long enough here, so you see there's uh, some vapor escaping. It's not dangerous, but it's expensive. So um, you should maybe wait a bit longer. And now you see uh, we have a nicely soldered board. Thank you so much, Rick. Um, I think it's really cool, like reducing the friction in this entire process. I think it's important to keep, uh, be sure that it's possible to like innovate with like low amounts of resources, because as we've seen before with the community, like that's really something that drives things forward. Um, so uh, questions, and I was actually thinking about something myself, like in this entire process, like what has been one of the biggest obstacles because like watching the talk, it seems like you've really overcome everything among the way when there was a little itch or something like what has actually proved to have been a problem because I guess there must have been something. Um, yeah, the biggest problem was uh, finding uh, the right deep fryer. So um, I, uh, yeah, I, I ordered, I think about uh, three different ones. And uh, now uh, everywhere I'm, I'm, I'm using my browser, I get uh, uh, some advertisements for kitchen appliance. And I think that will last for some time. But uh, yeah, um, uh, finding one that can be modified easily and uh, that has this, this flat bottom. So yeah, I, yeah, uh, I uh, ordered a lot of them and, and sent them back. Uh, but uh, yeah, finding the right one, then, then the process is, is pretty easy once you have the right one. And also the, the modification takes just a few minutes. Sounds a lot like uh, trial and error on that part. Um, I'm, I mean, it's 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 awesome that it worked out, and I get I guess like it's just part of the prop process with like the advertising stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. If you if you do something like that and want to misuse a part, then then use a private browser tab for that. <laughs> because uh, yeah, I'm not really interested in kitchen appliances, but uh, the algorithm doesn't know that. That's that's great. Uh, yeah, just um, just uh, and now um, we will uh, be uh, taking the questions that have come in through the internet. And um, so one person is asking: so if the Galden is uh, two hundred and thirty degrees, um, can it be? Can the solder uh, be lead free? The yes, solder yes. paste, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm using uh, lead free uh, solder for for. 
yeah, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to use that at Sordo with uh, with this process because it, it works uh, just fine. I know a lot of people who who do who use uh, the the pizza oven method or a cheap Chinese uh, reflow oven. Um, they use leaded soda paste uh, just because uh, it's easier for to to get the the lower temperature right. But for this, it it really doesn't matter. So um, it, it works great with with leaded soda paste. And also in the demo, I used uh, lead uh, free soda paste. So. That's awesome. I think that was an important uh, thing to uh, to to be able to to figure out. Um, so another person is asking, so with the discussion about fluorinated chemicals, is there a need to revisit the safety classification of the Galden or like, is that um, fine? Um, I think the, so, so you're really using just a little of it. And um, there is uh, as long as you don't heat it up too much, um, it's completely safe. If uh, if you would manage to somehow heat up the gallon um, above 290 degrees, it would break down and uh, there would be some hydrofluoric acid uh, um, uh, coming out of it. That would be very, very bad. But uh, so so you have to make really sure that you have enough gallon in it because the only way that that could happen that you heat uh, up the vapor too too much, I think, uh, would be to to put too little in it. If there's just uh, a very little bit uh, in it, it could be that the bottom gets too hot, and then it could break down. But um, you, you really yeah, it, it, it's hard to to get the vapor above two hundred ninety degrees if if it's not under pressure or anything. So um, I think. It's pretty safe and it lasts very long. So uh, I probably I bought this uh, 400 milliliters and it probably will last forever. From time to time, there's uh, some um, uh, residue uh, in the in the garden, but you can just run it through a coffee filter and then it's fine again. So it's it's uh, you're not really using it up. It's it's just uh, like a tool and then it will last a very long time. So, and uh, extending on the last thing, so someone who's a bit freaked out with chemicals and stuff like that, for instance, me, like, how do you actually go about it? Like, what's the absolute worst thing that could happen? Uh, the worst thing is the hydrofluoric acid forming um, when, when you get it too hot. So it's something, so I would recommend uh, to, if you do that, do that outside, uh, uh, take all the precautions, use safety goggles, use, um, uh, use gloves. And uh, the, uh, maybe also use your your FFP two mask if you're if you're really afraid of it, and and then if you, if you do it outside and and never uh, look away if if while you're using it. So um, if if you're done using it or if you walk away from it, uh, disconnect it from the power, and um, yeah, as uh, with everything, so so it's really hot. Two hundred. You don't want something that's two hundred thirty degrees on your on your hands. Or so so just uh, don't be stupid. Sounds like a but, same uh, precaution. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the garden is actually, uh, so if you have seen the, the uh, film The Abyss, um, it's, it's an old science fiction movie where they are underwater and they are breathing in um, a liquid that has oxygen in it to uh, go deeper. And that is actually the same stuff. And uh, there are, yeah, you can find pictures on the internet where they have rats in, in, um, in, uh, in small glasses with the stuff in it and they're breathing it and... and uh, so it's really, um, yeah, unless you, you make it too hot, it's really inert and it doesn't react with anything. I'll refrain from asking you how the movie ends. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I'm, it, it's a long time since I've seen it. But, yeah. No worries. <laughs> cool. Um, so next question is, do you need to... to uh, do you need to remove the condensed Galvan vapor from the components, or how does that work? Um, there's actually very little on it, so, so they feel dry. So um, I don't, um, I don't uh, clean the boards afterwards. Um, I think, I think that's fine, and uh, there, there's not really much left. So yeah, there's the stuff condensating on it, but I think most of it drops down, and, and they're not wet to the touch or so. So yeah, I don't I don't clean the the boards afterwards. Okay, I think it's good in these kinds of situations to like figure out what someone who's a bit more experienced or very more experienced, like yourself, uh, basically uh, handles and and does in that kind of kind of situation. So 
Um, one of the next questions is that if whether you have checked if the plastic can safely be heated to 230 degrees, and I think they're basically referring to the deep fryer here. Oh, that's uh, that's all. Um, there are some plastic parts, but uh, the the container is is metal, and um, there there is on the top lid there are some plastic parts. I, I made some experiments first, and uh, it, nothing uh, melted. But um, yeah, I have to see see what happens. Uh, I, I used it, I don't know, ten or twenty times, and it's it's fine until now. Um, but yeah, yeah, probably th this device is not made for that kind of heat. But it's made for one hundred ninety degrees, and I think two thirty is not too far from that. So uh, until now, it it caps up nicely. But again, yeah, it's it's a hack. It's it's not really uh, really made for this. So for me, it works fine. But uh, you, you know, yeah. Uh, you, you have to be careful if you try it out yourself. Cool, thank you. I will just uh, check if there are any like last under falling rope questions. I don't know how you say that in English. And I think that was actually uh, everything for now. So as I said previously, Rick, like thank you so much. It's it's really great, especially considering that as as. The more you can take in at home, the easier and faster this process will be and basically also lower the cost. And like, I at least personally feel that that's very important. So I, I want to say thank you. And uh, I think that uh, the audience agrees with me. So thanks a lot. Okay. Then yeah, have fun uh, soldering at home. <laughs> <laughs> we will, thanks. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye.